Welcome to our membership classes, the first one of the four-week classes. So what we want to do in these classes is help you understand a bit more about our church and also specifically congregationalism. Because we are one of, in terms of congregationalist churches, one of three in Gauteng who belong to the Evangelical Fellowship of Congregational Churches South Africa. The other congregational churches belong to the United Congregational Churches of South Africa. So we are a separate denomination from them. Now, congregationalism is a name used of people in the 16th century England. So it was men and women who saw themselves as part of reviving the church of the earliest Christians. In other words, they wanted the church to become like it was back in Jesus' day as he established it and as the apostles led it and taught their different doctrines. So they wanted to revive the church to get back to that. So they shared the universal faith of the church as it was restored by the reformers. So they were part of the reformed belief as well. Now, why did they become this distinct group? You see, the thing is, in a time when the queen had been freed from rule by the pope, they opposed the queen now actually taking over the church because they believe that no man or woman is the head of the church. Not even the pastor or any person that is preaching is the head of the church. The head of the church is Jesus Christ himself. So they said that if the state controls a church, it would only lead to coerced religion and not true saving faith. So they wa wanted to avoid nominal Christianity. They wanted to avoid people just being part of the church because they're forced to be part of it. And they coerced to be part of it. They wanted true saving faith. So they believed that the church needed to reform itself according to the word of God. Okay. Then... They also stood for the freedom of the church from all ecclesiastical and political authorities under the word of God alone. So congregationalists have two distinctives that we hold. Two things we are known for as congregationalists that make us unique. The first one is the only head and ruler of the church is Jesus Christ. So it's not the Pope, not the Bishop, not the clergy, not the Queen, not the government. And he alone rules the church through its members, that is, through His Spirit in each local congregation. So when it meets together to worship and to take decisions under the sole authority of the Word of God. In other words, Jesus is the head of the church, no other man, woman, person, no one else but Jesus. And our foundation as a church, as congregationalists, is the Word of God. So any decision we make is based on the Word of God solely. We make decisions based on this and then we take it to our members. So in terms of polity, in terms of how our governance structure works as a church, since Jesus is the head and our basis is the word, it is not me who makes a decision and it just runs with it. We make decisions biblically and we take it to the members to vote on it because it is everyone's church and the members are meant to then make the votes on. Do they agree? Is this doctrine true and biblical? Do they agree with the rules? Do they agree with the vision and mission of the church? Do they accept the vision and mission of the church? Do they accept the terms of membership, etc.? Do they accept new people into membership? So it's taken to the members. So where traditional churches have a top-down governance system, our church system is a bottom-up governance system. So the members in and of themselves are actually part and parcel of the leadership of the church. So it is not just the deacons or elders that make the decisions. It has to come from the members. That is a, another distinctive of congregational churches. It is the members themselves who actually make the decisions and have a large part in making these decisions. Another distinctive we hold as congregationalists is that not all citizens of the state are members of Christ's church. In other words, it is only those people whom Christ hath redeemed unto holiness and happiness forever. In other words, those who are true and genuine believers, who have a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Those people who have sincerely covenanted with God and with one another as a congregation in each place. In other words, what they then do as a church is to walk together in all the ordinances of God's ways 
and His Word. So, it is for these specific distinctives and principles that Congregationalists actually endured immense persecution. Because the state wanted to control the church and they were not happy with a group of people now saying, you don't. The Bible tells us Jesus is the head. The Bible tells us, just like Jesus was able to resist temptations, Congregationalists said, but it is written. So we stand on the fact that it is written. If it is not in the Bible, we reject it. Anything that is not in the Bible, we absolutely reject it. We are a biblical church. That is what we are based on. Now, when it comes to membership within a congregational church such as this one, the tradition of congregation must stress that one needs faith and commitment to be a church member. It is very important. You can't not have saving faith and then become a church member. You must be true, repentant, and have saving faith. And it is also seen that the faith and commitment of the individual members determine the life and witness of the church. Because at the end of the day, it will be people will look at the members of the church and say, if this person is part of Faramir Congregational Church and not living a life suitable and pleasing to God, it will affect the witness of the church. Because then people will think, but the entire church is that way. So it's a very important thing to remember that, as I've often said, we may be the only Bibles many people ever read. So if our witness does damage to Jesus and His image, then we are not truly Christian. And then we are also damaging His universal church. Because people will look at it that way. And moreover, a church with not just a few chosen leaders, such as this one, but all its members make the decisions. It is all the more necessary and important that its members need to be not merely nominal Christians, but actually committed Christians. You see, a nominal Christian is just someone who warms the pews. They, they just warm the pews. They're not really active. But in a congregational church, we are active members. We get together. We are involved. We become a family, more than just a mere building. So we can't just have nominal members, especially considering members have all these duties of getting involved and making decisions and being a part of the leadership. But the basic question that we have as a church is the following. Have you personally accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And have you committed your life to Him? That is the most important question we have. Are you truly genuine and sincere in your faith? And have you accepted Him as your Lord and Savior? And committed your life to Him and Him alone? And this is the central issue. That we have as congregationalists. The central issue is, are you truly a Christian? Okay. With this comes, do you read your Bible? Do you pray? Do you come to church regularly? Do you live a good life? Can people see the witness of Christ within your life? Are you feeding into God's Word to grow spiritually, to go spiritually, to share the Gospel? Because if you've committed your life to Christ, you'll get this desire and hunger to do stuff for Him. Not that these works will save you, but through a saving faith, it leads you to this desire to want to do works. As James said, faith without works is dead. But we don't do the works to save us. We do the works because we want to. And the works is sharing the gospel, being a witness of Christ, spending time with God, meditating on His Word doing what he wants us to do. So this question and some of his implications were put to you now. These implications are also spelled out more fully in our constitution. You see, in our constitution, we have the essentials for membership. And the constitution is available on our website as well. But just to give you some ideas, so the essential conditions for membership is a personal confession of faith in Jesus Christ as the Savior, who through His death and resurrection, by grace alone, and not by any righteousness or merit of our own, reconciles us with God. So we never think we did anything to merit it, to deserve it. It is purely grace alone. Sola gratia. Commitment to Jesus Christ as the ascended Lord, whose authority extends over every area of life, 
belief in the one God who by becoming man in Jesus Christ has revealed himself to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we believe in the Holy Trinity. We are a church that believes in the triune God. One God, three distinct persons. We believe in the Trinity. We are Trinitarians. Then acceptance of the Bible as a decisive witness of God's salvation and will for humankind, supremely revealed in Jesus Christ. Also a turning away from sin and a reliance on the Holy Spirit for power to carry out Christ's teachings in our daily life. Also, a desire to glorify God in all things which issue in the faithful worship of God, daily prayer, and the giving of time, talents, and money to witness to Jesus Christ, to help the needy, and to strive for justice and peace in society. So these are some of these essential characteristics that we have as congregationalists. So we strive to live out these principles within our lives. And all of these principles are founded on God's Word. There's nothing we do which is not in the Bible, as I said. If it's not in the Bible, we reject it entirely. Now, the only other condition for membership is that you accept the constitution of the church. Now, faith in Christ and commitment to Him, that is the central issue we have. That is a central thing we want. That is the central condition for membership, to accept Christ as Lord and Savior. Now, when it comes now to church attendance, it is not by coming to church that you are saved. The church does not save you. Jesus has saved you. But one thing that is true, if you've committed your life to Jesus and you've given your life over to Him, you will have that desire to fellowship together, to come together, to fellowship, to worship, to be together with God's people, to worship Him, share in hearing the Word, and be involved in going out and taking His Word to other people. You get that desire. So it's not in coming to church that you're saved, but you do get this desire to come to church and to read your Bible and pray and to develop. Because you see, we believe also that Christians are not Christians in isolation. We are not islands. We need each other to build each other up, to strengthen one another, to encourage one another, to help one another through deep times, dark times, because everyone might have problems. And we are here for each other. We're more than just a building. We are a family of congregations. So we stand together and we support and strengthen one another, especially as we're all seeking to work together to walk in God's ways together. You see, we read in Romans 12, verse 5, In Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. So when you think about it, how can you be joined to the head if you are not joined to the body? So that is why... It, it does become central that we help each other and build each other and encourage one another. So, for this reason, also in our constitution, it requires that those who apply to become members should attend our services of worship regularly. Otherwise, we'll know they're nominal Christians. So we need committed members. Now, to explain a bit more about our church and what it is we also stand for. See, our, our vision here at FCC is to be a Christ-centered, Bible-based, and Spirit-filled family church impacting the community with the grace and love of God. So to achieve our mission, we have the following mission statements. We worship and glorify God as a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We proclaim the grace and love of God to all people in both word and deed. So evangelism is something we hold to. We disciple and equip believers for ministry and service. We impact and transform the community around us with the love of Christ. And then finally, we also nurture and develop families to serve one another and others with grace, humility, and love. So what we are is we are an evangelistic church. We are evangelical, which means we do not just have a light and we put a bucket over it and keep it to ourselves. As a church, we take the light to the community and to other people. And especially with our online, it's also what we try to do is to reach more people, to share the gospel with more people. So that is our mission and vision. And out of this, 
we find our core values is that we worship, we evangelize, we disciple, we impact lives, and we serve. So our core values stem from our mission and vision to serve and to build up people and develop them for service in the church. Then, to give you an idea of our beliefs, our basis of faith. So as I said, our church is affiliated with the Evangelical Fellowship of Congregational Churches, South Africa. We hold to the following beliefs, our basis of faith, which is also available on our website. Firstly, there is only one God who exists as three distinct and equal persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So God is a living God who is almighty, eternal, unchanging. He knows all things past, present, and future. And we worship God, the one true God. Then the Bible. So God's greatness and holiness are such that without His aid, man can neither understand Him nor find a way to a right relationship with Him. In His mercy, however, God has made Himself known. He has revealed Himself through creation, but human sinfulness blinds us to the glory of God. Because of this, such revelation is inadequate to bring anyone to salvation. God has therefore revealed himself definitively for our salvation through the Old and the New Testaments. So in other words, if we did not have the Bible, we would not know Jesus, God, the Holy Spirit. We would not know what the way to salvation is. So we strongly rely on the Bible. And then with humanity, God created human beings perfect and in his image, but after being tempted by the devil... By their own free choice, disobeyed God and became sinners. So humanity is now corrupted in every part by sin, and so fellowship with God was broken. All humanity is actually deserving of eternal punishment. But that is where the good news of salvation comes in. Jesus Christ came to earth to die for our sins and die in our stead, take our punishment upon Him, and through Him our fellowship with God was restored. So we believe strongly in salvation, the gospel Jesus is the risen Lord. You can go to his grave. It will be empty. All other so-called saviors' graves are filled. Their bones are there. You won't find Jesus because it's empty. He is a risen Lord. We believe in the Holy Spirit who must work through us and bring us to salvation. We believe in the second coming. But our church is unique when it comes to belief in the second coming. We believe there will be a rapture. Pre-tribulation rapture. And then after the tribulation, Jesus will have his second coming. So the second coming, we believe, ha occurs in two phases. To better understand it, watch the foundational message, the Galilean wedding, to understand why we believe in the rapture. Then we believe Jesus will be the judge. We believe there's one true universal church. And all these other local churches form part of that one universal church as established by Jesus Christ. We believe in baptism and the Lord's Supper. And then our church accepts the earlier formulations of faith contained in the Savoy Declaration, the Declaration of Principles of the Formation of the Congregational Union of England and Wales, and the basis of faith adopted by the Evangelical Fellowship of Congregational Churches. So that is what we hold to in our basis of faith. So the Savoy Declaration is very similar to the Westminster uh, catechism of faith so it's, it's almost like a summary of that with some things changed to suit congregationalism so in terms of our beliefs our mission and vision and our basic membership requirements that is then our first membership class next week we'll look at more in depth in the history and what we where we came from, where we're going, and then also where you fit into where we are going as a church.